A black man or woman, understandably, could have felt less than impressed by the clamor over fascism abroad. What did the blacks have to preserve at home? Segregation was almost total. Even some lynchings continued. Yet they responded to the war with patriotism, working in defense industries, fighting for a democracy in which they did not fully share, and dying for the cause. We're glad to welcome you here today and into the United States Army. I got to go for the man called Uncle Sam. I got to cross the ocean wide. He hands me a gun, says, Take it, son, don't it fill your heart with pride. I'm red, white, and blue, black and true. Why does he need me now? Only yesterday I had no say. Seems a little strange somehow. You sleep in that bed, you'll make it. You wear them clothes, you'll wash them. You walk on that floor, you'll clean it. There's no service here. More than three million black Americans registered for the draft during the war years. But more than two thirds were judged to be unfit for the rigors of military service. They were suffering from physical and educational malnutrition. The 888,000 blacks who were accepted by the armed forces trained and served in segregated units. Even heavyweight champion Joe Lewis, the most famous and respected young black man in America, was not allowed to soldier with whites. America's first Negro sailor trainees are reviewed by their chief, Lieutenant Commander Daniel Armstrong whose father led colored troops in the Civil War. Commando-type drills are a daily must for these men, and they're standing up magnificently. How'd you like to battle your way through heavy bags of concrete? Like all other Navy men, these first Negro detachments at the Great Lakes Naval Training Center are strictly volunteer. 50% of the black servicemen were shipped overseas. Most were assigned to segregated transportation, supply, and construction units. Only a relatively few black draftees were given the chance to fight. An all-black tank battalion landed in Normandy on D-Day and fought its way to Germany. In Italy, black infantrymen won 65 silver stars for bravery. Black soldiers in the Pacific fought their way from Bougainville to Saipan. An all-black fighter squadron flew more than 1,500 combat missions and shot down an estimated 260 German planes. Most of the pilots had been trained to fly and fight Hitler's Luftwaffe at a racially segregated air base near Tuskegee, Alabama. He tells me, fight for my country. Give my life, just do it with my kind. He'll call me when he needs me yeah, sometime soon. Lord, has he lost his mind? Well, I'm red, white, and blue. It's my country too, I was ready to go before now. Oh, why can't he see what he's saying to me? We could win this war somehow. I'm no different than you. I love my mama too. She asked me to understand. Uh, sometimes I do, sometimes I don't, and I'm confused with the law of the land. Well, I'm red, white, and blue, I want my freedom too, but my brother needs me now. Oh, why can't he see what he's doing to me, together we could win right now. Together we could win right now, we could win this war right now. Black entertainers volunteered to produce special radio programs for black servicemen overseas. Mother says it's in the groove. Daddy says it's hot. 
Backwards, it spells Zila Booze. Now, brethren, what have you got? You've got Jubilee! <laughs> An avalanche of fan mail from all fronts and outposts testifies to the popularity of Jubilee. This 30-minute radio show is one of 106 recorded programs shipped overseas each week by the Armed Forces Radio Service from headquarters at Los Angeles. You sad sacks in your khaki kilts and you swingy salts on your pewter scooters, batten down your GI pork pies. And now, here's your master of ceremonies, Jubilee sweater boy, Ernie Bubbles Whitman. Thank you, thank you, thank you, devotees of the Limp Largo. With your permission, I'd like to do a few imitations. First, there's a familiar fellow we've all seen standing in track number five just before the 20th century pulled out of Chicago for New York. And he goes something like this. Oh, boy. Train leaving for South Bend, Syracuse, Rochester. Coming, Mother! <laughs> well, bless my big fat soul. How are you, Rod? Fine, Ernie, but I have a little problem. I brought a chick with me tonight. I wonder if I, one of you could help me out. Well, I'll be glad to take off your hands, son. Just a minute, big boy. That's not my problem. Oh. <laughs> what I want to know is, should I bring her into the studio and take a chance on losing her or leave her out in the hall and likewise? <laughs> well, then, by all means, bring this gal in. Okay. Come on in, honey. Fellas, here's Lena Horn. You know, fellas, we here on Jubilee use a language that might sound off the cuff to some of you. When we dedicate a number to, say, a sad sack jack from Fond du Lac, a latched on jack and a khaki sack, woo! <laughs> we say it that way because, well, I guess because we feel it's a little more personal. We send our hellos and our songs and our laughter, yes, and our hearts clear around the world to you. Then we say to ourselves, we know by your letters that in your spare time, lots of those same fellas hear our jokes and our music. And that makes us try all the harder to send you week after week the kind of entertainment that you used to look for back home. So keep letting us know what it is. This is your program. How about us telling everybody about consequences? OK. Hear it, boys. <laughs> Consequence, but who's scared of consequence? Let's sip the honey while it's sweet. We could be messing round, but you is digressing round while I'm tossing nature at your feet. Why don't we mosey round? You could be cozy round again. More than 4,000 black women joined the wax and the waves and served in segregated units. Many found themselves relegated to menial jobs in mess halls and laundries. There were only four black nurses in the United States Navy during the war and 500 in the Army. Their assignment was to care for black servicemen in the segregated military hospitals. They were not permitted to care for whites. That policy changed after a contingent of black nurses was sent overseas to care for black casualties. Upon their arrival in England, the nurses were welcomed by Brigadier General Benjamin O. Davis, the first black general in the history of the U.S. Army. Captain Petty and nurses, I am told that you are the first colored nurses 
to come to this area. I know that you are going to live up to all of the traditions of your noble profession, and the American people expect great things of you. That month, most of the American casualties were white. The black nurses were ordered to care for wounded German prisoners of war. There was public outrage. Army hospital rules were changed, at least in England. But most racial discrimination went unchecked. German POWs were often treated with more respect than black GIs. But it was different at home. The black serviceman was a hero to his family and his neighbors. Two million black Americans were working in the war plants. Many of them were women. For black war workers, just as for whites, the war meant steady work and high wages. But that was not all. There was a matter of patriotism, of contributing to the war effort, which concerned black Americans as much as it did whites. Harlem needed air raid wardens, after all. There were hundreds of black volunteers for civil defense and war bond drives. For any kind of job they were allowed to do. There was some agitation for civil rights during the war years, but not much. There could have been more. But the majority of American blacks felt, as did whites, that winning a war had priority. If Hitler wins, the NAACP told its membership, every single right we now possess and for which we have struggled here in America for three centuries will be wiped out. If the Allies win, we shall at least have the right to continue fighting for a share of democracy for ourselves. In the 30s, black musicians like Louis Armstrong had built a cultural bridge between white and black America. Even so, the United States during the war years remained a segregated society. Most white Americans thought that was the way the country was supposed to be. The sophisticated Duke Ellington was as popular with white Americans as Glenn Miller. White Americans admired the talents of black musicians and entertainers Eddie Anderson and Cab Calloway, Lena Horne, Billie Holiday, but they continued to exclude most black Americans from the political and social system. Jim Jam Jump is a solid shot. Makes you nine foot tall when you're four foot five. Hep, hep. I tell you I mean it. I want for When Joe Lewis defeated the German heavyweight Max Schmeling, many white Americans, with no sense of irony, saw it as democracy's victory over Hitler's doctrine of Aryan racial superiority. One documentary about wartime boom towns was unusually frank in depicting black poverty in the South, but racial segregation did not seem to be an issue for the government filmmakers. Mobile, as every American city of any size, had its slums before the war. But when a nation is at war, 
it becomes clear that the health and welfare of each affects the health and welfare of all. Lack of comfort, lack of rest, illness breeding in conditions like these mean time lost from production. Each citizen living poorly weakens the fabric of the society in which all of us live. These people and these conditions too suddenly become a problem to be faced in solving the health and housing complexities of a congested war town. Slum clearance projects had been the local private enterprise of a few high-minded, far-sighted individuals. But in Mobile, such projects as these have become one of the obligations of good government. They are rented only to certified colored war workers and are equipped with auditoriums, playgrounds, and day nurseries to take care of the children while their parents are working in the war plants. Even the nursery schools were segregated. In 1940, three-fourths of all black Americans lived in the southern states, mostly in the rural areas. The war brought a tremendous shift in population as hundreds of thousands of blacks left their homes and went looking for war work. Those who found jobs in the cold industrial north were hard-pressed to find adequate housing. There was no paternalism in Detroit. Blacks found themselves competing with unsympathetic whites, not only for jobs, but for a place to live. Racial animosity, which simmered beneath the surface of American society, erupted in Detroit in the summer of 1943. 25 blacks and nine whites were killed in the rioting. 700 people were injured. 600 were put in jail. Six thousand American soldiers were sent to Detroit to patrol the streets and restore order. There was more racial violence in New York, Philadelphia, Chicago, and other places in the North. The National Association for the Advancement of Colored People enrolled half a million new members during the war. CORE, the Congress of Racial Equality, was founded in 1942 and staged a few sit-ins and demonstrations. But throughout the war years, most black civil rights leaders urged restraint in the interests of national unity. Many black leaders hoped that once the war was over, sympathetic whites like Eleanor Roosevelt would lead the nation towards racial equality. President Roosevelt seen here reviewing segregated black troops stationed in Liberia, did not do very much for black Americans during the war years. National unity and winning a war, so he seemed to believe, required maintaining the racial status quo. Even so, he remained extremely popular among blacks. Not until Vice President Harry Truman succeeded FDR were the armed forces desegregated by presidential order. During the war, Lieutenant Ronald Reagan narrated a government film about Tuskegee's black aviators. Implicit was an acceptance of racial segregation. It's morning, 20 miles from the enemy. These are American boys going to work. The morning fighter patrol. Enemy planes. The odds are bad this morning, nearly three to one. It's three Nazis spinning down in blood and flame to every one of ours. Routine morning patrol. They're good planes, wonderful planes. And their pilots are good, too. Uh, yesterday, I fulfilled one of my ambitions as a combat pilot. I got one airplane. Deep inside Alabama is a famous school called the Tuskegee Institute. It was founded on July 4th of 1881. And since that Independence Day, it has graduated many thousands into agriculture, into science, into industry. This school was the first of its kind. And its founder, Booker T. Washington, was a pioneer who broke open a road for others to follow. This man had a dream, and the dream became stone. He lifted the veil of ignorance from his people and pointed the way to progress 
through education and industry. Close to this school, close to the work this man had done, the United States government determined to build an airfield. Three years ago, this was just another farm in Alabama. More than trees had to be cleared away. There was misunderstanding and distrust and prejudice to be cleared away. Three years ago, there was only an idea. But ideas are powerful things. And today, there are fighter planes flying overhead. In addition to fighter groups, a year ago, this field began to train men for medium bombers. And that, too, was a pioneer step. But one thing it proved, you can't judge a man here by the color of his eyes or the shape of his nose. On the flight strip, you judge a man by the way he flies. Here's the answer to Adolf and Hirohito. Here's the answer to the propaganda of the Japs and Nazis. Here's the answer, wings for this man. Here's the answer, wings for these Americans. For the most part, World War II was a segregated affair. Black infantry units began fighting in Italy in the summer of 1944. They lost 3,000 men and won 1,300 Purple Hearts. In the Pacific, black soldiers followed white marines up the islands toward Japan, mopping up the battlegrounds and flushing out the last fanatical defenders. A lot of dirt and not much glory. Death, of course, was the great equalizer. Black or white, wives and mothers got the same telegrams. Franklin Delano Roosevelt died suddenly on April 12, 1945. Harry Truman became president and commander-in-chief of the armed forces. Nobody mourned President Roosevelt more than black Americans. He had been their one best hope. And they wept openly as the caisson bearing his remains passed by. Americans were united in their grief that day. The mourners stood side by side, black and white together. Roosevelt had personified the American war effort, and now he was gone. And Americans, black and white, wondered what will happen now? Only a relatively few black Americans got a chance to distinguish themselves in combat during World War II. But some did, and that was important. Most black Americans did not get very good jobs in the war plants, but some did, and that was important too. In spite of racial discrimination and segregation in the war plants and in the armed services, some black Americans managed to see something of the world. They learned something about themselves and their country. Change was possible and perhaps inevitable. 